Once you have marked your songbooks, let me encourage you to take a Bible, if you will. Open it with me toward the end of this great book. Back to Hebrews chapter 2. That is where we are going to be reading together this morning. We are so thankful that you have joined us. And it is a joy and a privilege to sing this morning about the fact that our Lord lives. He is no longer in the grave. He rose on a first day of the week just like this. And because He lives, we can gather together and sing about the greatness of our God. To sing about the sacrifice of Christ. To sing about how He is going to come with shouts of acclamation and take me home. We spent some very encouraging time this morning in our adult Bible class talking about that truth that we have sung about this morning. And we have sung about how the Lord has always been faithful to us. How can we be but anything faithful to Him? And we have even sung confidently, I'll never forsake my Lord. And I hope that you have meant those words as we have sung them this morning. We have spent over the course of this year so far time talking about some very encouraging things. Beginning the first Sunday morning in January, really what we have focused on over the course of the last two months in one way or another on Sunday mornings is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. How it binds us together and it inspires us and it, it, it gives us songs to sing and it points us forward towards home, towards this hope that we have. There are absolutely good and encouraging and very appropriate times to talk about the good news. But God's Word also encourages us to be balanced. To recognize the possibility of straying from that good news. The Apostle Peter himself very confidently told the Lord, I will never forsake you. Those are the words that we have sung this morning. He confidently looked the Lord in the eye and said, even if I have to die with you, I will never forsake you. And he was so convincing that he inspired the others around him to, to chime in. And yet we know not decades or years or months or weeks or days, but hours later, he in fact did just that. Could I encourage you this morning to soberly reverently read with me the words of this inspired writer in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 that warns us about drifting. Hebrews 2 and verse 1, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. That's a very specific and vivid verb that this writer uses. It carries with it naturally the idea of being in a body of water and, and floating. And Maybe you've experienced this before. Maybe along a, a, a river, maybe in a lake, maybe something as small as a swimming pool. You're sitting there relaxing on one end of the pool in some sort of a float. And you've got your eyes closed and before long you realize that you've drifted all the way over to the other side. And in the swimming pool, that's not all that big of a deal. Maybe it's been in some sort of a river and here you are fishing, just minding your own business and without really paying attention to your surroundings, slowly but surely you've drifted far from where you left your vehicle. Maybe it's been in some sort of a lake and you've got all sorts of refreshments and, 
and lunch over on one end of the lake and you've been out right around the middle and you've been having a good time and, and just floating on a boat or a raft or a canoe of some sort and before you know it, you're all the way over on the other end. And in order to get back on this hot sunny day to where those refreshments are, you've either got to get out and walk or you've got to make up for the drift. Drifting in and of itself doesn't have to be dangerous, but in this sort of a context, it absolutely is. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it much further than we ever intended to go, maybe into very dangerous white water, maybe right to the brink, maybe without thinking, all the way over to disaster. We never saw it coming. We were daydreaming. We were enjoying what we had. We were talking a good talk and encouraging other people to notice what all we were able to accomplish and the good things that we were doing. And before we know it, because we were not paying close attention, we have gone over the edge. And individually, or as families, or as a congregation, the impact is disastrous. We'll come back to Hebrews 2 before we're done this morning. Turn in your Bibles with me to the last book, back to Revelation chapter 2, that reinforces for us in no uncertain terms that it is possible. So very possible for entire congregations of God's people to conduct themselves in such a way that the Lord disowns them. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. Words of Jesus Himself to the church in Ephesus. I have this against you. Revelation 2, 4. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. At first you were angered. At first you were right where you needed to be. But you've drifted. And you don't have the love that you had at first. In fact, you've abandoned it. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Turn around. Recognize the dangerous waters ahead. Do the works you did at first. Get grounded once again. How serious is this? If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Only the Lord knows when that happens. I don't know when a congregation's lampstand is removed. You don't know. No other human being on this earth knows. All that we can do is judge the fruits of individuals and congregations and entire groups of people. Jesus encourages us to do that. He tells us that we will know people and congregations and situations by the fruit that they bear. But the Son of God Himself in this real life situation says, this is getting so bad. You are drifting so far from the Gospel moorings that if you do not turn around, I will come and remove the lampstand from its place. <clears throat> Would you consider with me, as you turn in your Bibles back to Acts chapter 2, five distinct changes congregations experience along the drift, the slow drift to unfaithfulness. Listen, this does not happen overnight. This does not happen because of one sermon or one quarter's worth of Bible classes. It's slow. It's a drift. More often than not, as we study God's Word and study human history, it happens over the course of generations. But it does happen. It has been happening for thousands of years. And here's where it starts. A change in attitude toward divine authority. 
how do entire congregations of God's people drift to the brink of having their lampstand removed by the Lord? Where the Lord would look and say, this group has drifted so far, regardless of what they say, regardless of how they describe themselves, regardless of how they pray or what they sing, they do not belong to me. They are not of me. How does that start? With a change in attitude toward divine authority. Listen very, very, very carefully to God this morning. Acts 2.36, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. I am a follower of the Messiah and the Lord. You are called by God to be followers of the Messiah and the Lord. We are not the Lord's. We are not the kings. We are not in charge. This is not about us. We are followers of the risen Christ who has all authority to command our obedience. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, he says, all authority, that leaves none for me. All authority, that leaves none for you. All authority, that leaves none for our elders. All authority, that leaves no, some sort of congregational authority. However we serve, we serve as stewards of the one who has all authority to command our obedience. When I became a Christian, when you became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you were to submit, you are to be in submission, you are to submit, I am to submit for the rest of my life to His Lordship. Romans 6 and verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves. You are slaves of the one whom you obey. Either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness. Thanks be to God. This is good news. You who once were slaves of sin have become obedient to the, from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you became a slave. I became a slave to the Lord who has all authority. I owe my life to Him. I owe my soul to Him. I owe my eternity to Him. I owe Him everything. And He allows me to be a slave. A slave of righteousness. Therefore, the only posture that makes any sort of sense in relation to his authority is this. Whatever he says goes. Whatever you do, whatever I do, whatever we do as a body, however we talk, whatever we say, whatever we teach, whatever we <coughs> preach, whatever we sing, whatever we do, however we serve, whatever the mission, whatever the goal, do everything in His name. Whose name? The Lord's name. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. How do I know what He wants me to do? He has shown it to me. He has preserved it for me. To the point that human beings who are stubborn and ignorant and rebellious, just like you, just like me, just like these people who lived 2,000 years ago, slow in heart to believe all that God has said, slow to apply, slow to submit and, and give away control, we can be told. It only makes sense that we would be told. Do not be foolish. As individuals, as families, as a congregation, don't be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Listen to me. We live in a world where it is very, very, very in vogue to act as if I just can't understand. There's no way 
I can possibly know. How would I even know if I found it? How would I even possibly begin to apply? How would I know this and not this? How, how would I know that this is really valuable enough to dedicate everything? God says, you can know. It's simply a question of whether or not you choose to be wise or foolish. And understand and apply what I'm telling you. How do congregations drift? Number one, with a change in attitude toward divine authority. Yeah, I hear that. Number two, you turn in your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. How do congregations drift with a change in attitude toward divine authority that gradually leads, maybe over the course of years, maybe over the course of an entire generation, to a change in motivation? The Lord has defined the motivation for His faithful followers. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. To Him, the Lord, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or even think. I can't even think of things that are impossible for Him to do. To Him, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church. There is our motivation. As a body, here is our motivation as saints who meet at 409 McNaughton Road and leave this place and go out and do our best to live as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. This is it. This is the God-breathed, Christ-centered, Spirit-defined motivation of it all. To Him be the glory. In the church, in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And when I allow myself to have a change in attitude toward His authority, the sky is the limit for my motivation. Maybe it's what the Apostle Paul described in Colossians 3 as self-made religion. I want religion made in my human. That is my motivation. Maybe it is man-made tradition. This is what I have always been told. This is what people have been doing within my sphere of influence for decades or even hundreds of years. And, and this is the motivation to continue to do those things even though I see this is what God has said in His Word. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's using what I can find here uh, to somehow get some sort of power or, or, or money or influence. Maybe it's family heritage. This is what was good for my mom and dad and for my grandparents, and it's good for me. Maybe it's nostalgia. I, I see that I can prove I ought to be doing this. I, I can see that I shouldn't be doing it. Based on this book, I can understand the reasoning. I can understand the logic. I, I, I can understand this is the will of God as it has been expressed in black and white. But I like this. And it makes me feel good. And it reminds me of growing up. Maybe it's cultural pressure. I just don't like being so peculiar, so different. I don't like to be a part of the only ones who aren't doing something. Maybe it's curiosity. What if this? Maybe that would be better. Maybe it's just plain old laziness. I want things the way that I want them. Period. That's just it. Maybe it's generational strife. You know, I, I just can't get over these old fuddy-duddies. They're, they just, they're stuck in their ways. And I think if we really just switched it up and turned everything on its head and threw it all out and maybe started to, to, to uh, reconstruct it all, we know better. We, we can make this better than those people did. Maybe it's denominationalism and the, the pull of that. That I just, I, I can't get away from that. This is the way I was raised and this is what I've always been told. Maybe it's just plain old the desire to be different. We are a whole lot like the culture of Athens 2,000 years ago that loves just to constantly hear something new. Never really applying, just dabbling. You drift from a change in attitude toward divine authority 
you got a change in motivation. Why am I going to do what I'm doing? Which gradually leads to a change in mission. What's the aim? What, what's the target? Why am I here? Why are we here? We've got all of these people who come together every week and, wow, we could really do something good. We could do some exciting things. We, we could really push the ball in any number of directions. And, and we know the Lord said... Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We, it, it's not hard to pick out the, the key verbs there that define the mission at least as it's defined here by the risen Lord. You go. You don't stay. You, you go and... You make disciples, you make followers of the people who need this good news. And having made them, you, you teach them to observe what you've been told. You, you teach them based on this God-given authority. And throughout the rest of the New Testament, that, that's encapsulated in just a couple of key ideas. Those people went. And they tried to bring others, others to, to faith and submission to the good news through evangelism. And, and they sought to build each other up. They assembled together regularly. And, and they were dedicated to what God had said. And building each other up and holding each other accountable. And encouraging one another along. And holding each other's hands high. And strengthening the weak knees and the feeble hands. And at times there were some very definite physical needs within that body of people. And so they engaged in, in a limited amount of benevolent work as much as they possibly could, sharing what they had with fellow believers so that they could get on their feet and continue to live life and not starve to death and, and function within society so that they could also be a blessing to others. And you know what? That's about it. Paul over and over and over again says things like, keep doing this just as you are doing it. That's about it. But you drift from a change in attitude toward divine authority to a, a change in motivation to a, a change in mission. And then it's not all that hard at all to see how there's a change in practice. The groundwork has been set. Sure, in Acts 2, 42, we read about those newborn earliest Christians, this newborn image of the church. What were they doing? What, what, what were they practicing? Well, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Because they had a specific attitude of reverence toward divine authority. And they devoted themselves to the fellowship. That, that was a part of their motivation. And they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and the prayers. That, that was a part of their mission to remember what made all of this possible and, and why they existed. And all throughout the New Testament that's commanded and it's shown and it's implied... But you've got a change in attitude toward divine authority that leads to a change in motivation that leads to a change in mission. And then the sky is the limit. Yeah, I, I can go back and I can see that those people, they observed the Lord's Supper and they sang when they gathered together and they prayed when they gathered together and, and the, the Word was powerfully preached when they gathered together and they contributed from their resources for the needs of the saints. But... You know, there are so many different religious groups that are involved in recreation. We've still got a lot of land here. This could facilitate a really nice gym. And, and we've got some much bigger rooms now. And, and, and we could think, we, we had a, a young man swing by the building earlier this week and he saw our new construction and he was just baffled that we wouldn't want some pop machines to go in some sort of the building to, to, in his words, keep the teenagers there. 
and you know, there, there's so much to be done. We, we could offer babysitting and secular counseling and secular education and all sorts of civil service and disaster relief and medical care and political work and investments and there are so many different business opportunities we could take what we've got and and leverage that could i encourage you to open your bibles with me back to first kings chapter 11 first kings 11 who would have thought this is the man who built the temple of the lord in jerusalem this is solomon first kings 11 he builds the temple of god who would have thought that his attitude would change to the point that we read in 1 Kings 11 and verse 1. He loved many foreign women. There's the introduction of the heart and motivation. He loved many foreign women in the language of verse 2 from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. Why is that? For they will surely turn away your heart after their gods. Step one, a change in attitude toward divine authority. Solomon didn't listen. And in verse 5, the man who built the temple was moved later in life to go after Ashtoreth, the, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. If we kept reading all the way to the point of constructing elaborate places of worship or idols. Listen, this is... This might not happen. This could not happen. This does happen. And it has been happening for thousands and thousands of years. It's not just an Old Testament thing. In 1 Corinthians 11, we read about real life saints like you and I who lived in, in the city of Corinth. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 17, Paul writes and he says, listen, in this, in what I'm about to say, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. In the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. That was a part of the mission. That was to be a part of the practice. But you have drifted. Listen, that didn't happen overnight. They didn't start out there. That church at Corinth was not doing at first what Paul condemned. But they'd gotten there. In eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another goes drunk. Listen, we have had more than one question asked over the course of the last couple of months. Look at all of this space. Why in the world didn't we put in a kitchen or a some sort of a dining hall. Don't you believe in eating together? And of course we believe. A, a, a fundamental part of the practice of God's people in Acts 2 was spending time together, sharing meals together from house to house. It's right there in Acts chapter 2. Do you know why we built what we did and didn't build what we didn't build? Here it is. We have houses to eat and drink in. And there is a danger of drifting. Listen, it is heartbreaking. I, I have sat down in the last two or three years with more people than, than I would have guessed who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s who now feel as if they are people without a heritage. Because they were a part of groups of people who four or five decades ago, began to drift. And there was all sorts of debate. Many of us don't even understand, have never really learned about how rough that debate was. It was rough for a reason. It's because there was drifting. 
the door was opening in a change in attitude toward divine authority that led to a change in motivation and mission and practice. And now you flash forward 30 or 40 years and you've got people in the latter ages of their lives who feel as if they can't find anywhere to belong. Because the churches they were a part of several decades ago, they don't even recognize anymore. They know conscientiously, I could never go along with that. How did it start? It didn't happen last week. You despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Let's end over in 1 Kings chapter 12, if you will turn back there. Changes in practice ultimately lead to changes in self-perception. So what's going on with Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 12? The 25th verse of the chapter. Here is new king of Israel, Jeroboam. And he knows what God has said about worship and where it's to be and how it is to be centered and how it's to be oriented. But he builds Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lives there and he goes out from there and he builds Penuel. And Jeroboam says in his heart, no authority beyond that. Now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. I, I don't want that. I don't want to lose all these people. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And I don't want that. And I know what God has said, but... And so He changes the motivation. You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Aren't you tired? Behold your gods. Change in mission. O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 28, he made two calves of gold. Change in practice. And it cursed God's people for generations to come. God's people, Christians, can deteriorate to the point that they believe they are rich and have prospered and have need of nothing, not realizing that they are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked in the eyes of the Lord. How does that start? It starts with a drift in attitude toward divine authority. It leads to a change in motivation, a change in mission, a change in practice, change in perception, change in terminology, change in argumentation, change in rationalization, change in excuses. What's the root? A change in attitude toward divine authority that can lead to shipwreck. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith. That's the authority. And a good conscience, that's the motivation. By rejecting this, changing the mission, changing the practice, some have made shipwreck of their faith. He mentions two men by... It is so serious, he says, I have handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Because right now, self-perception is shot. It is over and over and over again documented for us. What's the answer? We must pay closer attention, much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. This morning, are you a Christian, a, a disciple of Christ? The call is plain. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. According to what? Not me, not your neighbor, not yourself. According to divine authority. 
Test yourself. Do you not realize this about yourself? That Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test. What's our calling this week? As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. Rooted and built up in Him. Established in the faith. Just as you were taught. Abounding in thanksgiving. This morning, if you know that you're not right with God, we point you to the standard, and the standard alone, unashamedly. People asked the question in Acts 2, what shall we do? And they were told, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Was that a one-time thing a long time ago that we should have outgrown by now? No, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. God is calling through the Gospel. He is able to deliver you whatever you find yourself in in this morning but you must come to Him and if we can help you in any way along those lines we encourage you to come to the front of this auditorium while we stand and sing